Come on and stand to your feet. Stand to your feet and lift your hands if you're grateful. Come on, lift your hands. Think about his goodness. Think about how far you've come. Come on, let's worship him. Think about, think about where he's taking you and how you know you don't deserve it. How he handpicked you out of the garden and set you aside and said, I'm going to elevate you. Not because of anything that you've done, but because of who he's desired and ordained for you to be. Come on, thank you for children coming home and doctors and negative reports being turned around and families being reconciled. Go ahead and go ahead and thank you for no drama doing Thanksgiving this time. It's just families gonna be happy just to see one another and Even thank him for those who have transitioned and the legacy and the imprint they've made for the family. You know, the holiday season is always a tough season, especially Thanksgiving and Christmas because it's the one time when we normally see family and sometimes families transition, mothers and grandmothers give my own testimony it seems like anytime there's a, a loss in my family it happens around Thanksgiving and Christmas but the blessing is in that is that during that time the whole family is there together one last time I remember like it was yesterday my grandfather departed in December my grandmother departed 10 years later in December but it was at that Thanksgiving the family was together to speak to them express their concerns. Father, we love you this morning. We're ever so grateful for your goodness and your mercy and for how you continue to show your love towards us. We pray now, Lord God, as we enter into this season of thanks. Truly, Lord God, every day is a good day to give thanks unto you. And we bless your holy and righteous name. God, I pray that you would anoint the ears and the hearts of those that are here this morning. To be able to receive you this day for what you desire to do in their lives. And even for the life of this church, God, you called us to a good work. And God, we need your strength to continue to be steadfast in the work that you've called us to. Now, Lord God, I prayed as I prayed many times before, I'm not able incompetent and sufficient of the task that stands before me. However, with your help of the Holy Ghost, allow your word to come forth with power and conviction. Truly, Lord, drops of grief can ne'er repay. The debt of love that I owe, dear Lord, I give myself away. It's simply all that I can do. It is in this name of Jesus that we do pray and all those who agreed did say amen 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 exodus the 19th chapter exodus the 19th chapter we are coming to the year's end i'm sure some of you have been asking when are we going to get out of this book but it's quite all right we're coming to the end we're starting a new series, actually a stewardship series in Exodus. And so we will revisit some texts that we've preached from before 
but with a different angle because we know that the word of God indeed is rich and with the help of the Holy Spirit there is always more to glean because God is all wise and has a wealth of information to give to his children and one of the ways in which we show our gratefulness and thanksgiving unto God is in the manner in which we give to God. Amen. Exodus 19, verse 3. We have been here before. And so we know this scripture, verses 3 through 8. Reading from the New King James Version. It says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. All the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in his presence. I pray that you will bear with me for a few moments on the subject entitled, It's Mine. Stewardship 101. It's Mine. Stewardship 101. Almost 20 years ago, I remember it as if it was yesterday. It's March 22nd. 1996, I was about three days before I would enter the fold into this illustrious organization that just celebrated 105 years of existence this past Thursday. I received a phone call, a disturbing phone call. My cousin and one of her friends were in a car accident. They slowed down did a rolling stop, but did not see the car that was coming. The car hit them, caused the car to flip over. Fortunately, their lives were spared. God saved them. That's the good news. Here's the troubling news. They were driving my car. Um, I remember the words my father gave to me when I received the keys. He said, son, you are the only person to drive this car. Now, you all don't know Dr. Alvin Taft Heatley. May not seem to be an imposing man, only 5'7 in stature, about 165 pounds. But I feared him dearly. I imagined how he would want to put his hands on me once I told him that there had been a car accident with the car he gave me to drive, except I was not the driver. So given my dilemma, I did what any good son would do. I called my mother. I asked my mother, this is what happened. I told her, rather, she said, um, okay, son, you're a man now. Call your daddy. Tell him what happened. So I called my father, told him what happened. He said, son, what did I tell you when I gave you the keys? I repeated what he told me. He says, okay, 
I'm glad everybody's safe. But you hear this. Next car you drive will be the one you purchase yourself. Truth of the matter is, my father relayed to me and reminded me, that car didn't belong to you. It belonged to me. I was the one that allowed you to drive it. But it's in my name and I have responsibility for it. That kind of conversation that I had with my dad is very similar to the conversation that God is now having with Moses. He's telling him that there are certain things that are set in stone and also that Moses is to adhere to his commands because the truth is Moses is called to be a steward and not an owner. And if we're going to talk about stewardship, the first principle we must understand is that everything belongs to God. As he says it here in verse 5, he tells them there'll be a special treasure. And here's the reason why. Because all the earth is mine. Stewardship 101. We know the story. Moses and the house of Jacob have now come here to this mountain to meet with God. God has brought them from a mighty long way. God has been consistent in his favor upon them, not because of anything that they have done, but simply because God is the one who will fulfill every promise that he's made. Brings them to this mountain, and they meet God for the first time in the desert, in the wilderness of Sinai. Can I park right there for a moment and just help you to understand that this really bothers me because if all the earth belongs to God, you would think that him who is king of kings and lord of lords would choose a very plush place, a paradise place, if you will, to meet with his people. I mean, he owns everything. He could have called them to a wonderful valley with fruits and vegetation and water and this wonderful place to meet with them, but yet God chose the wilderness to fulfill and to reveal himself to him. The good news for us today is that should give us some sense of encouragement because the truth is you don't have to be in a well, comfortable environment to meet with God. In fact, it does not matter where you are. God has the power and the ability to be able to reveal himself to you. In fact, as I read the Bible, I find that God does some of his best work in the wilderness. It was in the wilderness that he called Israel out of Egypt. It was in the wilderness that he walked with them hand by hand and foot by foot and led them that way. In the wilderness, he made provision for them, giving them what they need. It was in the wilderness that he brings them to this mountain to meet with him. It was in the wilderness that Jesus took two fish and five loaves and fed 5,000. It's been in the wilderness where he went on a hill called Calvary. And did his most magnificent work. God is a God that can reveal himself in the wilderness. And so they come to this wilderness place. And God has some concerns and some commands to give to Moses. He tells them why he brought him here. And in this we see the beginning of stewardship. He wants to establish them as a nation. Helping them to understand that if you're going to be my people, there's a certain way in which you have to live. You have to do things the way I've ordained for them to for you to do. And you can't go about your own way doing that. They sit here and before God gives them the commandments, before God tells them how the priestly garments should look, before he gives them the dimensions of the tabernacle before he gives them the way in which they should mix the anointing all before he tells them how they should represent him as a nation he says there's one thing that they are clear about who it is they're serving and what belongs to them he says if you will obey my covenant and keep my voice then you shall be a special treasure to me for all the earth is mine God says, what I'm about to walk you into belongs to me. What I'm about to give you belongs to me. In fact, where you are right now belongs to me. 
because it's mine. That means that everything in the earth is mine. Can I help you to understand that means your car belongs to God. Although I know you might have a payment and you went to the bank or used some sort of security and bought the car. The truth is it's made of fiberglass and rubber and glass that comes from the earth, which means it has its beginning from the earth and the earth belongs to God. Your house belongs to God. Yes, I know you may have had it paid off and you got a mortgage payment, but the truth is the brick and the mortar and the wood and everything that has been used to build your house came from the earth and the earth belongs to God. That means your house belongs to to God. Your money belongs to God. Yes, I know it's a nicely printed, minted piece of paper that comes from the tree and it has the inscription of the U.S. Treasury Department, but the truth is if there is no gold to back up the money, it's just a piece of paper and the Bible says that God says the silver is mine and the gold is mine. That means your money belongs to God. You belong to God. I know you came from your parents and you feel you have this independence and your own life but if you have been washed in the blood of Jesus don't you know that you have been bought at a price and that price was Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross giving his life for you and Paul says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit you don't even belong to yourself therefore you must be special about how you conduct your business with your own body because you were purchased by the price of the blood it all belongs to God. You belong to God. Everything you got belongs to God. The church of the living God belongs to God. This pulpit belongs to God. This microphone belongs to God. This robe belongs to God. Those pews belong to God. This building belongs to God. Everything that we do in the house of God, it belongs to God. So the question becomes, how do we be good stewards over what God has already owned, but he's given us the responsibility to manage. Definition of steward is one who manages the affairs, the finances, or the possessions of the owner. And the truth is, this should be very apparent, that we are nothing more than managers of the things that we feel we possess. Because if it belonged to us, it would go with us when we transition. But let me give you this news flash. When your name is called and your time comes, whether your family choose to cremate your remains or put you in a casket and roll you down here, there will be no procession of your car, of your house, of your clothes, and everything that you think you own. Your bank account will not be going with you. It will be transferred to somebody else to manage because it does not belong to you. You are a manager. In fact, Job said it like this, naked I came into this world, and naked I shall return. It's the Lord who gives, and it's the Lord who takes away. And if God is the one who gives, and if God is the one who takes away, that means that God is the one one who owns a life in itself belongs to him. Therefore, our charge is to be good stewards over what God has given us. Are you with me this morning? I want to encourage you to give you some incentives as to why you should be a good steward. And it's right here in the text. One of the reasons why you should be a good steward is because you got a good history with God. Yeah, you've got a good history with God. It's right there. Verse 3, God says to them, you remember how I bore you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. You saw what I did to the Egyptians. He's trying to remind them of everything that he has been for them, which is why they should have an incentive to be able to obey him and do what he says because of what he has done. So let us go through the Bible since we've been in Exodus all this time. Let this serve as a history lesson or a reminder of the goodness of God to the people of Israel. It was in Exodus 12 where God showed that he was good to them because he sent the death angel to kill the firstborn but God made provision and said I want you to take some blood and put it over your doorpost and when the death angel sees the blood over the doorpost that means the death angel will pass over your house because what is intended to kill you will go 
by you because God gave them a Passover blessing. That was in Exodus 12. In Exodus 13, God gifted them with the materials to build a nation. They got their freedom and walked out with gold and silver and cattle. They went from slaves to being a very wealthy nation in one move by God because God had a history with them. God had a history with them in chapter 14. They found themselves between a rock and a hard place ahead of them, a body of water with no boat or no transportation to get over to the other side. Behind them, the very the Egyptians that wanted to kill them, but God made a way for them where they did not even feel the mist of the river, of the sea, to be able to get over because God has a history with them he had a history with them in chapter 16 when they came to a place and grumble and complain against God as if God had not done anything for them in their life but God still opened up the banks of heaven and gave them bread and food to eat gave them water from unusual sources gave them quail they had food to eat that was in Exodus 16 and Exodus 17 they find themselves at war again tied from worshiping but as long as Moses kept his hands lifted up blessing the name of the Lord we know that they defeated the Amalekites because God had a history with them he had a history with them in Exodus 18 Moses was about to lose his mind dealing with all the contention and the confusion and the stuff from the people but his father-in-law Jephro gave him some wisdom that allowed him to keep his sanity and his mind which means God has a history with them well that is the nation of Israel that is the house of Jacob that's God's history with them let me come to Shiloh Baptist Church is is there anybody here that's got a history with God? Is there anybody here can look back over your life and flip the chapters of your story and you can see God right there in the beginning? Have you had an Exodus 12 moment? Was the intention to take you out of here? Was the intention to bring tragedy to your house? But by the blood of Jesus, God sent an angel and the things that were intended to get you just happened to pass over you because God cared for you. Have you had an Exodus 13 moment? Have you been freed from anything? Has your mind been in bondage? Has your people been in bondage? Did you get something that you didn't deserve? You were indebted, but now you came out debt free and you got more than you had before just because God said that you would have it. Have you had an Exodus 14 moment? Have you gotten to the place where you were stuck? There was something afraid ahead of you that you couldn't get over and something behind you that was coming to get you, but God said his word was true when you pass through the waters they will not overtake you when you walk through the river you will not drown in fact you won't even feel the water because God will make a way out of no way and allow you to go through have your had an Exodus 16 moment have you been hungry have you been in a wilderness place have you been in a barren place but God showed you just how much he is God that he does not need the proper environment to bless you all he has to do is speak and when he speaks the blessing will come have you had an Exodus 17 moment have you been tired but you press your way to worship God and as you begin to worship God you saw that God defeated every enemy that you had in fact he made your enemies your footstool is there anybody here that's got a history with God you know that God will come through you know that God will step in you know that God will show out you can't even explain it but if you thought about it all you can say that if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side if God didn't go before me if God didn't stand by me if God didn't stand up in me if God didn't make a way I don't know where I would be you got a history with him who is God that should be your incentive to be a good steward because when you was not a good steward God still kept you still provided for you still was faithful to you still made sure you had everything that you need and more gave you stuff you couldn't even deserve but he still did it the history with God therefore you should be 
a good steward. Can I push it further? Not only do you have a history with God, but what God is trying to get Moses and Egypt, rather Israel, to understand that as he brought them out of Egypt, he's trying to give them a new identity of who they should be and how they should respect God. And the, one of the ways that they should respect God is the manner in which they worship God in how they give. Why? Because it is attached to being holy in God's sight. Right here he says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He's saying, I have given you dominion over everything in the manner in which you represent me, priesthood. You are going to be the mediator between the other nations of this world and me, priesthood. Then he says, you shall be a holy nation. A holy nation is one that is set aside or set apart. But as I did more study, the primitive root of the word holy in Hebrew means to cut or to separate. Remember that. Cut and to separate. What does this have to do with stewardship? Well, when you think about stewardship in its biblical foundation, what we do when we give essentially is cutting and separating something that God deems to be holy. I'm in the Bible, Leviticus 27:30, the tithe of the land, your seed, your fruit, your animals is holy unto God. So when we speak about the tithe that we give in church, we already know it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. But God puts another designation on top of it saying it is holy unto him. And since we are the chosen generation, New Testament priesthood of believers, we are the holy nation that represents God. If we're going to be holy in our being and in our worship of God, we have to consider those things that are holy unto God, meaning you, and even the manner in which we give to God. Because in Israel's time, they, their economy was of animals and fruit and what they produce from the land. They did not have currency. We have currency. So the transition of the translation for our time is there still has to be something that is holy unto God. So when we speak about tithing, we're not asking you to do that just because we want you to give a tenth. We're asking you to do that because God has declared that thing as being holy unto him. Which means if you are a holy nation and you are going to worship God and you love God and you desire to be pleasing in his sight, the thing that he asks you, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be a special treasure. Then obeying his voice and keeping his covenant is taking what is holy unto him and separating it, cutting it, and allowing him to have it. This is not for the benefit of the church. This is for the benefit of you. Because what I have discovered, that every month, expenses and income don't add up. I don't care how conservative you're trying to be. We in Northern Virginia, you understand? This ain't Georgia. A little bit different with taxes and all kind of stuff. You got to pay to park your car. And if you don't pay the parking car, you get a ticket. They're charging you to park your car to get money. That's extra expenses. And sometimes when I look at what we have and the fact that the family is expanding, and I got a little girl now. See, the boys was cool because boys don't really get a whole lot of stuff. But now Crystal is excited because she got a girl she can dress. And they need all this stuff. And I'm scratching my head like, Lord, have mercy. 
What have I done? God, I had nothing to do with the gender. You had this. So, amen, praise him. But you, you, you got you to gotta separate some stuff because although it may not add up or end up, what I found out is it always happens in God's timing. And I never miss anything that I didn't have in the first place. I had to prioritize. The things that I'm trying to give because I now have more responsibility. So on paper, it doesn't look good. But at the end of the month, I'm still making all my obligations and I got more. And I can't explain how it happens. But I know it's because at the beginning of the month, when I get the check, there is something that I cut and separate and give it to God because it's holy to him. Which means now because I'm in covenant relationship, God has an obligation. To say to do and hold up his end of the bargain because I've done what he asked me to do. Now he has to do what I expect of him because God is just and holy. So when I give the tithe, that really is my security deposit. That says I am trusting you to take care of me. I don't know how you're going to do it. But if you can call and make sure that Daniel don't get eaten by no lions, if you can walk in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you can take Israel from bondage and care for them in the wilderness, if you can make water come from a rock, if you can give them food, well, I just believe you can take care of this country boy like me. So I'm going to give this to you, and I'm trusting that you will do what you said you were going to do. And I'll tell you every step of the way, I can't even explain it. Checks just be arriving in the mail. People just coming to bless you. Even before I was pastor, when I was struggling at my last church on furlough, losing 20% of my salary, then got married and had all this stuff happen. God just, God don't need the bank to give you money. Ask Elijah. He sent ravens to feed him. And I just think if God can send a raven, he can send somebody to bless me. Is there anybody in here that's ever known that God can bless you any kind of way he wants to bless you? That's why our ancestor said, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. I don't care how you do it. I don't care how you give it. But the fact that you do do it, and I'll be satisfied because I put my trust in him because it's holy unto him. Can I push it further? Reason why God is wanting them to understand this ideal of holiness even in the manner in which they give is essentially because the things that we give to suggest the things that we worship. What we give to on a consistent basis has an inclination about the things we value. You hear me? God is telling them that they're to be a holy nation. And he asked them right after this to consecrate themselves and to present themselves for him. The reason why he's trying to shift their identity is because they've been slaves for such a long time in a land that had idolatrous worship, which means their familiarity and their experience is one of idolatry. And now God's got to call them out of that. And so a part of his calling them out of that is transforming them and helping them to understand who he desires that they be. So he has to show them a whole new way of how to approach him and worship him. That's why he brought them to the mountain. Because this is not a place that you would think God is. But what he is saying is, I'm so much God, I can appear anywhere. And everywhere I am, and because I'm omnipresent, I'm everywhere, you are to worship me. But you cannot be fallen or get into the idolatrous, sinful nature, which is why in the commandments he tells them, don't build no carved image. Don't you build anything that you saw other people do. I'm a jealous God. You worship me. Here's how it transfers into our giving and our stewardship. The truth is we struggle with certain idols that we create, mainly stemming from the idols of control, significance, and comfort. Those three. We build an idol of control 
Because when we feel like we're controlling the finances of our house or wherever we are, we think we have power. Therefore, we don't release what belongs to God because in our minds we feel that we're in control. But the truth is you've never been in control and you never will be in control, especially in your house or in God's house because everything belongs to God. So we have concocted an idol in our mind that says we must control the situation as opposed to just being and trusting that God will provide. That's control. Significance is this. We take our money and place it on things that we feel are significant because of the way it makes us feel. Because we want to seem like we have some significance and affirmation before other people. You know how people ask you what kind of car you drive, where you living, where you went to school, where you work. All those things say something about you and your experience so that people will think more highly of you than they would in your own humanity. Because you want to be significant, you say, well, I'm not going to give this because I need this because I got to maintain my status. Because I can't have people thinking that I can't afford some, some things or that I'm less than. When the truth is, from the day that you had your first cry, you were already significant. Because God has already created you a little lower than the angels. And he's already blessed you. And it's in him that you have your affirmation. And as long as God considers you to be significant because you are a child of the king, why would you stress yourself and worry about how other people feel you? I'll see about you and, and what they feel about you. You know what the most freeing thing that you can have in your life is not to care what other people think. When you get to that place where you're only concerned about what God says you are and not concerned about what naysayers and people are saying about you because they ain't your God, they didn't create you, they can't kill you, they can't provide for you, you will free yourself to freely be who God wants you to be. And I just wish we had a whole church of free people that could be able to be free to themselves not concerned about what the neighbor says, not concerned about what this person says, not concerned about that. Only if it's in holiness now, if people are given justification for your godliness and Christian love, listen. But if they're just saying stuff about you and they haven't talked to you in the first place, please do me this favor. I wish you could just give them the hand or just turn a deaf ear in fact, I love how Howard John Weston told me to get some noise-canceling headphones because the only person you should be listening to is, the, is God and the people who God has placed in your life to help you go forward. But because you're so caught up in being significant in your status, it now affects your giving and you blocking your own blessing because you're in your own way. Significance. Comfort. You like money. Amen. Praise God. I like it too. But here's the thing. It don't belong to me. It's not mine to begin with. But we have this notion of being comfortable. We just want everything to be good. We don't even want to balance a checkbook. We want to get to the place we can just buy. We know it's there. And keep on walking. But we react on impulse. I need this. Let's just go get it. I need this, let's just go get it. And you good because you like being comfortable and you like how it feels. But there are times where God will have you reprioritize the things that should be a priority. And what I found is it's better for me to be comfortable and rest in God than it is to be comfortable and rest in myself. Because if I rest in myself, I'm going to drive myself crazy because I don't want to handle everything. You know what the easiest thing for me to do as pastor? Pray. God, this is what you said do, and this is what we're going to do. Uh, these are your children too, and you talk to them too. So what you told me, I pray that they have a way to hear from you. I pray that your word is the same word that they're reading, that they don't have a version where it's different, but this is what it is. And because of that, you just keep on moving. I pray that we all could have that spirit sometimes Amen. just to be able to understand that once you're comfortable with God, 
you find out that God will make you uncomfortable with yourself on numerous occasions, especially when it comes to your finances. Because, again, sometimes stuff just don't add up. Think about it. Tithing really is illogical. You're going to give 10% to something you really can't see and you think you know but you really don't know. See, you can see your house, see your car, see your children, see your spouse, see the clothes, see all that stuff. But when you give your time, do you really see? Because it's a faith move. And faith is illogical. Why? Because we walk by faith and not by So it really is kind of crazy. But I also understand that the foolishness of God is wiser than humanity's wisdom. And I'll take the foolish things of God any day before I take the wisdom of a human being. So since God says it's holy, cut it off, separate it, and give it unto him and watch him do it just like he did it for Isaiah in Genesis 26 in a barren land where there was a famine. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I mean Isaac, not Isaiah, Isaac. And what Isaac did in that time was plant. In a famine, in a drought, he planted and had more than everybody else because his increase was not based upon the vegetation of the land. It was not based upon the water and the irrigation. It was based upon God said plant. So he did what God said do, and he got the produce and the expansion of his territory because God said it. But what is God saying to us? He's saying that you should tie, period, and watch him do it. Try him and see. In fact, he says, test me in this and see if he won't open up the windows of heaven. Pour you out a blessing, not that you can get so much stuff, but that you can get out of your own way and trust that he is God and that he's going to take care of you. But as you know, we'll say yes. God, we're going to do it. Just like these elders said in verse 8. They said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. That was at chapter 19. If you know your Bible and keep reading, you'll find out that some of these same elders said, Moses is taking too long on the mountain. We need a God. So they influenced Aaron, the great high priest, who heard the same word, to build a golden calf. They build a calf and create their own God, although God told them, don't you build, no carve image, or make anything in the likeness of the earth and worship it. But they did that. After they said they were going to do everything that the Lord said, they got the instruction. As soon as they got the instruction, they did the very opposite of what the instructions were. So our God said, I'm done. He wanted to kill them off. But it was Moses who came before him and interceded on their behalf and said, God, if you do this, then how will you fulfill your promise that you made to Abraham? And what will the other nations say? They won't even believe that you're God because you'll be acting in anger. And so because of Moses' intercession, these very same people that were disobedient got help. And the truth is, all of us need help. Because it don't make a whole lot of sense, especially given these turbulent times we don't know what direction this country is going to go in. We're seeing all kind of foolishness, and everything's happening. And the first thing that people are going to do is hold close to their pocketbooks and their wallets, make sure they move everything into savings to make sure that we got enough. But I just believe that no matter how the times present themselves, my God is still able, and my God is still constant. He's consistent in his faithfulness. And the truth of the matter is, just like the nation of Israel had help by a man named Moses who interceded on their behalf, you and I have help as well. In fact, our help came a long time ago because we have someone.
that makes intercession for us. In fact, he's at the right hand of the Father, even now praying for us. When you don't believe in yourself, he believes in you. When you don't think you can make it, he knows you can make it. Because he's the one that did make it. Let me tell you how he interceded. He went to a hill called Calvary on a Friday afternoon. And around the ninth hour, the Bible says that he hung his head and that he gave up his ghost. And he said he was finished. But the truth is the ministry on earth was finished. But then he made a transition and went down into hell and made sure that he knows that all authority has been given to him under the earth. And the hope for our belief came on the third day. We call it Sunday morning. And the Bible says that they went to the tomb on that morning and Jesus was not there. They came to the tomb where they arrested him, but all they saw was linen strips. They came to the place where they laid him, but he was not there because early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand and Jesus is my help. He helps my unbelief. He helps me in my faith. He helps pushes me forward. He helps me to obey him and to trust him. And I found in my life that if I would just obey him and give what belongs to him, he will always, without a shadow of a doubt, show himself to be faithful unto me. Anybody here got that same testimony? Have you seen the faithfulness of God in your life? Have you seen God accomplish everything that he said he was going to do? Have you seen God be faithful even in your giving? Hallelujah. He's a faithful God. He does what he said he's going to do. And if we would just learn to give what belongs to him, he will do it.